Autocorrelation is one of the key features of a time series, one of the key things we use when we try to understand a time series. Now let's introduce it by starting with the lag plots that we talked about in the last section. There we were looking at plots like this, where we see observations of a time series plotted against lagged values of that series. In this case, Y is the, the time series Y is beer production, uh, quarterly beer production in Australia. And we're showing YT against YT minus K for different values of K. The correlations associated with these scatter plots are called autocorrelations. The name simply comes from the fact that auto means self, so it's self-correlated, how something is related to itself. So the correlation associated with the first of these graphs up here is called R1. Um, and then the second one is R2, and R3 is associated with the third plot, and so on. So it gives us a series of correlations related to how values of a time series are correlated with each other. Now, if I um, compute those, I do it in this way. Uh, firstly, we take the sample autocovariance, which looks like uh, the first equation here, this one, and then we divide by the variance. So we get the autocorrelation from the autocovariance. If you're familiar with sample correlation and sample covariance from other areas of statistics, not time series, the formula is slightly different. Um, but we use this formula because it gives better properties in time series. But I'm just pointing that out because if you go and calculate sample correlation from YT and a lagged version of YT, you may find you get a different answer um, using the default settings in most statistical software. This is how it's calculated for time series. So R1 indicates how successive values of Y relate to each other. R2 indicates how Y values two periods apart relate to each other. And as K increases, you've got how K, how the Y relates K periods apart. To, to do this calculation in R, we simply pipe the data set, and I'll continue using the beer production data that we looked at in the last section. We pipe the data set into the ACF function. Notice it's capital A, capital C, and capital F. There are other functions in R uh, for handling different types of time series objects with other choices for whether it's capitalized or not, um, but we're going to use all uppercase here. Um, so we could take a Tibble object and you pipe it into the uppercase version of ACF, and then you give it the, um, the, the column you're interested in, it will produce an ACF Tibble for you. Um, there, there are some defaults, but I'm setting here lag max equals to nine. You can't actually see all nine of them because they disappear off the screen but it gives us back a tibble with nine rows or however big the lag max is and two columns. The first column, which is your time index is actually just a lag, a lag index. So it's a particular type of time index. And the second column is the correlations of all of those graphs. Um, if I then pipe it into the autoplot function, it'll produce a graph that looks like this. So it plots each correlation against its lag. Uh, ignoring the blue dot dash lines for now, the black vertical lines are the correlations associated with those nine scatter plots that you saw before. So you can see, for example, that quarter four and quarter eight have very strong positive correlations, and quarter two and quarter six have very strong negative correlations. And that's because in the corresponding scatter plots that we had earlier back here, the quarter four and quarter eight. Um, uh, multiples of the seasonal period, four quarters in a year. And so they show as strongly positive because peaks are plotted against peaks and troughs against troughs. Whereas lag two and lag six, these two have strong negative correlations because you're plotting peaks against troughs in those ones. When you plot them all together like this, we sometimes call it a correlogram. It's a plot of the correlations at different lags. 
if I leave off the lag max equals nine, it'll choose a, um, a suitable number of correlations to plot. In this case, it's plotting 18. And uh, you'll see that at the quarterly multiples of four, eight, 12, and 16, for all of those, we have strongly positively correlated um, values. And that's because of the seasonal pattern. Um, and you get the negative ones at the other, at the multiples, well, at two, and then multiples of four times that. Sorry, that plus multiples of four. Okay, another way to think about the autocorrelation function is in terms of generations. And I'm going to show you some nice little cartoons that were drawn by Alison Horst to explain um, correlations. So here we have, think of each observation as another generation. And so we're going, time is going forward to the right, just like it does in a time plot. And so if you think of yourself as the most recent observation here at the end, and then your parent was the previous observation, your grandparent two observations ago, and so on. Then in this particular family, um, each of the little monster figures tend to be a little similar to their parent and their great grandparent, but quite different from their grandparent. So if you look at the whole picture again, you'll see that the this generation and this generation, and to some extent, this generation are all a bit similar, but they're all quite different from say two generations ago. Um, this one here, and then this one here, and this one here. Okay, so you've got people that are similar to their parents and great grandparents, but different from their grandparents and very similar to their great great grandparents. The autocorrelation function is simply showing you this information. So at lag one, you look at the correlation between each of the monsters and their parents. And, you know, they're, they're somewhat similar, um, they're not totally different from each other, but the similarities are not as strong as for other generations. At lag two, you're looking at the relationship between each monster and its grandparent. So this guy and his grandparent, and this guy and his grandparent, and this guy and his grandparent, and so on. All of the different pairs that are someone and their grandparent. And they tend to be quite different from each other, so you get a negative correlation. At lag three, you're looking at the relationship between someone and their great-grandparent. So they're three generations apart, someone and their great-grandparent. And again, they're not very strongly related. And then at lag four, you're looking at someone and their great-great-grandparent, or this guy and his great-great-grandparent, and so on. And they're very strongly related to each other. Okay, so if you think about it in terms of generations of uh, little monsters, then the correlations telling you how similar generations are from each other. How what's the gap you need to see the strongest relationships? Um, and you put all this together, and you get the autocorrelation function. So in summary, the autocorrelation function tells you the correlation between observations and those that came before them separated by different lags or different generations. Okay, so when we have different types of data, the patterns in the data will show up in the autocorrelation function. So if data have a trend, the autocorrelations for lags, for small lags, tend to be quite large and positive because values that are close together in time will also tend to be close together in value. When data are seasonal, the autocorrelations will be large at the seasonal lags at multiples of the seasonal frequency. And if they're both trended and seasonal, you'll see some combination of those. So let's look at some examples. So here's an example which is both trended and seasonal. So this is US retail employment, it's monthly data. And you can see that it's generally trending upwards. Um, and you can also see there's quite a strong correlation with a big spike every year when um, 
employment in the retail trade peaks for the year. If I do the autocorrelation function for this set of data, so I take my retail data set and I pipe it into ACF, and I say I'm interested in the employed column, and then I pipe that into autoplot, you'll see that there's all of the correlations are, that are shown up to lag 48 are strongly positive. That's because of the trend. You can also see, if you look quite carefully, that it tends to peak a little bit around, I'm just exaggerating it here so you can see it, it tends to peak a little bit around the um, seasonal multiples. So this is monthly data, so the seasonal period is 12. So at 12 or 24 or 36 or 48, it's a little bit stronger at that, those lags than it is in the neighboring lags. So that's the effect of seasonality. Um, so you get this sort of scalloping effect. Sometimes it's stronger than this where it, it looks like this. Okay, as you go forward in, as the lags increase. Okay, let's look at a, another example, which has no seasonality at all. So this is Google stock prices in the year 2015. So the data is, um, well, it's not daily because the stocks are not traded every day. So you see when you print out the Tibble, there's an exclamation mark in the square brackets indicating that it's irregularly spaced. There's not, it couldn't detect a regular spacing here. And if you look at the timestamps, you'll see that there's an observation on the 2nd of January and then on the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th and 9th, and then there's a weekend and then on the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th and so on. So because of um, those days when they're either public holidays or weekends, you get uh, irregular spacing. If we pipe this data set into autoplot, um, so you can see the time series plot of the data, you can see that there's, over this period, there was sort of wandered up and down a little bit, some big jumps and some big falls, but generally it was trending upwards. Um, and if I pipe that into ACF, um, to compute the ACF, you'll see that um, it's given me, and I've asked for 100 lags because I really want to see a lot of detail here. You can see that they're all quite strongly positive um, and starting off quite close to one because the, the price of neighbouring um, closing prices on consecutive trading days are going to be fairly close together. When I do the plot of that to create my ACF plot, you can see it's generally slowly going down, but they're strongly positive for a very long number of lags. All the way past 75 lags, they're still positive. That's typical of stock price data and it's typical of trended data. Okay, so that's a bit of an introduction to ACF plots. We're gonna look at these a lot throughout the rest of the book. Um, it's very common to plot autocorrelation functions um, of time series, it's even more common to plot them for the residuals of a time series model. So when we get up to modeling, we'll be doing these types of plots on the residual series that we create. Um, they, they're quite interesting to, uh, to explore some things in the time series that you won't necessarily see if you just do a time plot. And in the exercises in this chapter, you'll see some examples where you'll identify things from the ACF plot that won't necessarily be visible in the um, if, in, if you just do a time plot. 